Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, people are still joining, but thank you for giving us some of your time today. Welcome to this Sales Hacker webinar. I'm your host today. I'm Colin Campbell, General Manager at Sales Hacker. Really, really happy to be here with you all. <clears throat> and listen, we take your time very seriously. Um, we're going to give you an hour of value here today. And since you're with us live, um, we want to make sure that you get more out of this than the folks watching the recording. And if, by the way, if you're watching the recording, thanks. Try to stop by for a live session sometime. We'd love to have you. If you're here live, what we want to do is make this really interactive and fun for you. So please just help us out. Go down to the chat button at the bottom, open that up. And right away, you're going to see a little blue button thing that says panelists. Change that to say panelists and attendees. And please just introduce yourself. Let us know uh, who you are, what your role is, maybe what you're working on, share your favorite beverage. Um, just say hi. That way you'll know you're not the only one watching too. While you introduce yourselves, uh, I'm going to take a little moment to introduce our guest. So today we're talking about um, expanding internationally. And as we all know, one of the most important things when you're deciding uh, how to sell a product is your total addressable market. Expanding internationally is a pretty darn good way to expand your total addressable market. But it's not easy. There are a lot of things to consider. And so today we're joined by Diane Albano. She is the CRO at Globalization Partners. They specialize in this. So she's going to give us basically like a lesson and here's exactly what you do. You'll leave today, by the way, with an actual playbook, like a workbook you can use to check things off as you go if you ever need to uh, open a new office. And um, Diane, what's cool about this doesn't just work at Globalization Partners. She was actually brought on to expand their offices into Europe and Asia and now Latin America, right, Diane? Right. That's right. right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so keep the chat active. We're going to take questions as we go, uh, which, like I said, I know you're here in the live version for a reason. We're going to get your questions answered. Just put them in the chat and I'll make sure you get some answers. And um, hi to Dr. Jeff Hoyle. Who else is here, Diane? We've got Aaron Callender from Chartbeat. Sell nice. newsroom software in 68 countries. Wow, welcome, Ooh. Aaron. And we've got a professor at sale, of sales at Central Michigan University. That's Dr. Hoyle. Teach advanced selling and negotiations in enterprise selling. Wow. Ooh. I know you're going to have great questions for Diane. Uh, professor Hoyle, thank you for joining. Um, let's, let's jump in. Diane, where do we start? All right. Well, uh, first of all, I'm Diane, and I'm so excited to be here and appreciate everyone joining. Uh, this is probably my favorite topic ever that I could talk about because I have done it many times. And then I'm helping thousands of customers that are our customers to also expand internationally. As mentioned, Colin, thank you. I'm Chief Revenue Officer at GP. And I have a history of working and having record-breaking results from startups all the way to multi-billion dollar companies. And I lead all the customer facing teams around the world. And I focus on the go to market strategy, delivering and optimizing revenue models and creating new channels. So I'm really excited to share my experiences with all of you. And as Colin said, we really would like to keep this interactive. So as you bring questions on, we want to answer them, right, Colin? That's right. Yeah. Bring them in, everybody. Uh, we've got some content to share with you. Diane is amazing. But we all know we'll have more fun if we're just having a conversation. So um, you can feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. So before we start, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about this company and why it was so intriguing for me to join a couple, almost a couple of years ago. And what we do is pretty easy. We simply hire anyone, anywhere, quickly and easily for you. And we bring our plat our platform makes it simple and easy to hire a remote team very quickly. We simplify all that international business by enabling organizations to quickly and easily set up um, employees in countries without setting up an entity or a subsidiary, which is the big labor of bringing on people around the world. 
but you find the talent, you, you find the candidates, and then we put them on our locally compliant payroll. So we're able to take all that complexity and compliant regulations and take care of that for you. And you can focus on your business. So um, why do we need a global sales strategy? I mean, I think a lot of you who are already doing this know. I mean, the biggest reason, of course, is to have, and companies are growing market share, or they're looking for the best candidate anywhere in the world. But an evolving business marketplace means companies are frequently evaluating how to maximize revenue potential and amid disparate economies. I mean, there's all kinds of countries around the world. There's 187 that we can work in, and there's different nuances that go with every single one. Global sales teams play an essential role. And to get the most return from your sales force, you need a strategy that can scale and fit your various target markets. Overseas expansion is an exhilarating prospect for many businesses, and I could speak from um, pure experience on that one. It's exhilarating. But for some, it can be pressing and sometimes stressful reality for others. Going global is a strategic maneuver, opening the next chapter for many organizations, seizing the moment to expand their global footprint. It can bring new markets, fresh revenue streams, high returns on investment, and highly specialized talent while revitalizing sometimes product development even. But of course, however, internationally expanding businesses should remember growth is a marathon, not a sprint. International expansion strategies are formal, multi-level strategic plans that businesses use to enter an overseas market establish a growing presence, and become quickly profitable. International expansion strategies make growth more structured and sustainable. When appropriately composed, these plans mitigate expansion risk and encourage efficient use of resources, timelines, and capital for that global growth. You so know, how Diane, do you, yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry, Paul. a quick question here. I know that like the subtext of this whole presentation you've got is that you need a documented plan. And one of the things that I meant to ask you is, um, is that actually common? Uh, you know, like I, I have this sneaking suspicion that when uh, businesses decide to open new offices, maybe for the first, second, or third times, especially, there's an understanding amongst the executives of what the plan is, but something not documented. And it seems like that's, you know, an important point you're trying to make. Is that a pain point that you see with your clients? It can be. I mean, there's always aspirations to, to grow internationally. And, and the thought is I can, I can build my business up more or I can hire now with the pandemic and people hiring people everywhere. I can hire talent no matter where it resides. But a plan and we'll go into this. In fact, that second line item right there, market research, is, is really truly the backbone of making that decision. So when we have decided and I have decided to go into different markets, it's usually based on first research. And secondly, and sometimes at the same time, it can be you're already seeing demand for your products and services in different countries. And you say, hmm, I've been serving them so far. On a and from a U.S. perspective, but ultimately it makes a lot more sense to serve them in country or in region because of mm -hmm. local languages, customs, all those types of things. So at Globalization Partners, when we decided to go international, we did the market research. We happen to have our own market research team that's now comprised of 13 people, but at the time, in the very beginning, there was only two or three, and we knew that. This whole international expansion was not just a U.S. thing. It's every country has companies that want to expand outside of their home country. And so how do you do that? And, and that's what we'll talk about a lot of why an, an EOR, uh, why our company helps to do that. But regardless of that, you know, what are some of the reasons that you do it and how do you do it and how do you make it simple? Because it's not you know, it's it's not easy, but it's not that hard either with careful planning to your point, Colin. We've got make a great sense? question. Yeah, it does make sense. Thank you. Uh, and we've got a great question from Dr. Hoyle. Do uh, 
Mr. Hoyle, thank you for sharing that. We'll come back to that because I think Diane's going to cover it. Oh, okay. So, you know, without market research, a do-it-yourself approach involves a lot of time. And that's why market intelligence is always important to have, at least as the backbone. And that's not too difficult to ascertain, again, both internally as well as externally. But sourcing talent also requires analyzing the presence of other big companies. So, for instance, um, three times I have started up European headquarters, including this company, in Galway, Ireland, for the EMEA market. Well, why did I choose Galway? I looked everywhere. I went to Sweden. I went to Russia. I went to Spain. I went to Switzerland. We considered UK. And then we looked at Ireland. And then where do you go in Ireland? There's lots of different cities. We chose Galway because there's a big source of talent and universities and things like that that bring um, everything from sales executives all the way to software engineers from a talent pool perspective. But also, if you go to Dublin, you're competing with 300 other large high-tech companies coming out of the U.S. So when you think about the talent, it's more difficult as you go into a bigger city in that instance than it was and is now with us in Galway, for instance. So that's what that means on the bottom point. <laughs> so... Um, these are the core elements that you need to look at um, when you look at a strategy to expand internationally. Of course, you, you need to have an audit. You need to understand the variables like product offerings, service types, overall brands that are market ready. Internal audits are multifaceted and tailored to the parent situation. So they can include analyses such as strength, weaknesses, opportunity threats, a SWOT analysis, gaps. Where are we now? Where do we wish to be? And which, where do we wish we were? And then how are we going to close that gap? And then market segmentation. So this can be looking at demographics, behavioral, geographic considerations as an, as an example. How much time would you say should be spent on the market research portion? I mean, I know by internal audit is only the beginning. Um, but altogether, process end to end, how much time is your team of 13 spending to decide what new territories to go into? Well, it's 13 now because we're looking also at lots more detail about market analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but in the very beginning, I would say it was a sense because we started to get leads in from other countries. And then we started to look at, we actually started marketing in certain countries. We would do the Google Analytics and see the search if people were searching for keywords that had to do with our business. And we started to see what the big cities were, where the meccas were of the places around the world that this was something that resonated. And then we just started to day by day, you know, sort of build that. So I came on board as mentioned in September of 2019, so almost two years ago. And at that point, it was decided we are going to go to Europe and we are going to go to Asia. We were already in Latin America more from a functional standpoint and the people that we have in Latin America and Mexico in particular at the time. And certainly we were everywhere our customers were because we have HR talent, legal and finance people around the world already. But from a go-to-market sales standpoint, we didn't have people yet in Latin America. I believe that they probably, before I came on board, looked at it as an opportunity, probably not a lot of data, but there was enough data from the market research team that said, okay, let's, let's step into these markets. They've got to be as big or bigger than the U.S. There's got to be companies in all these different countries that are, again, wanting to go either into the U.S. or go to other countries next to them or in another part of the world like Asia from Europe. Or, or Asia into Europe. And so I would say, you know, we kept, we kept refining it and we started hiring. And then all of a sudden we just blew it open with market spending because we saw the demand with market spending, hiring sales, hiring marketing, hiring operations, sales operations types. Then we would, we hired HR, we hired finance, you know, and we hired all the support structures too to support that, that go-to-market in both Europe as well as in Asia. 
And so we've been busy, Colin. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> we've been very busy. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah. Now might actually be a good time for Dr. Hoyle's question too, because I sure. think these slides start to answer it. But um, he's asking what it's maybe even um, if you don't have a team of 13, right? Let's say we've got one sales analyst who we're ready to dedicate to some market research. Hmm. Um, what are the key metrics that person should focus on with their time for A, whether it's time for us to expand and B, where to expand to? Mm. And those are hard questions because they that's the detail, right? That's the yeah. detail of finding out. So it, it's not as if you just say, I think we should go to the UK and start to serve EMEA. There's got to be some kind of information that you're getting back. So from a sales and marketing standpoint, if you have a website, you're going to be able to track where your leads are coming from. Everyone has a website. So, you know, that's number one. And you can see if you are already having demand outside of your home country. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you're selling, is it something that will resonate in those countries? Or is it just some people, as the saying goes, kicking the tires? So yeah. the big KPI would be, you know, do you see the lead generation? Is there some type of demand already? But secondly, if you're using an analyst, they can start to understand what is going on in that market from a competitive st standpoint. So I'll get into that um, right here on this slide, because at the end of the day, are the competitors there yet? Are they doing business there yet? These, this is all analysis that can be done. You can figure it out. You can look on, you know, there's all kinds of ways now with the way that we do business versus the way we did prior to 20 years ago. It would be, you'd have to hire a McKinsey or a BCG mm -hmm. or, you know, one of the big something to do that analysis for you. Now you can do a lot of it with, you know, just a couple really good key people. But that competitive analysis and understanding it in that new market will be as important as finding out if there is demand. Because you want to find out, is there, and, and this is always the case, are there local competitors as well as the big ones that you already have as competitors? So, for instance, when we looked at it, we knew our competitors were dabbling. We didn't yet know who the players were from a local standpoint. So when we went into EMEA, and we were in some of these sales environment type bids, we found that, oh yeah, there are plenty of smaller companies that are in country or in another country serving another country. Um, but we were oftentimes still encouraged to continue to move forward because we were, you know, we had a lot of gravitas when it came to the experience across the market that we could serve these customers. So hopefully that answers the question, Professor, but feel free to ask more. <laughs> so I, I show the components here of what to look at, which is that competitive analysis and the market analysis, and then further looking at, okay, what's the strategy going to be and how is my brand going to resonate? Uh, what kind of channels? So the first thing that I've done every single time that I've gone into a new market is look for channel partners, or we just call them partners or alliances. And if you've done it already in, in one market like the US, you know what kind of partners to look for. And that's exactly what we did. So we set up a huge ecosystem in just the last year and a half of over 200 partners that we have across the world that have, why would a partner be important to us? They have a constituency of customers that want to expand globally and don't know how. So that's our ideal customer profile. And so for us, it's very natural to work with partners that have that type of customer base. And then of course you work on what's in it for them as much as what's in it for us, right? You have to have a bilateral agreement there. And then um, from a localized infrastructure plan standpoint, of course, being compliant is so important and really understanding what the rules and regulations are for doing business in that country. And that's when you get into hiring people, maybe it's going to start, a lot of people say, well, I should start with 
a senior sales, maybe manager, or I should start with an executive. You have to decide, you know, is it, is it going to be someone that's going to lead the whole region or is it going to be someone that will be part of that region and just make a decision? So for me, I've always felt as though I should hire the top person that can come in and really help to be the evangelist initially and then can help to hire the team around that person. And so that's what I've done um, most of the times that I've expanded or every time that I've expanded in these various markets. Do you think that's a key, like a must have a local presence, somebody who can on the ground, um, I'd say even before you open the, the office, like to be there for researching and guiding decisions? That's an excellent question. I think the answer to that is yes. But as you grow the team, if you can bring in an expat too for the culture of the company, that's even more ideal. So when we opened EMEA, um, let me see, that's all three times. Two of the times on the last three with EMEA, I brought in some or sent someone from the U.S. to Galway, for instance. And um, when it came to Asia, that was more difficult. So we did hire people that were a little more senior, but it is always great if you can bring in someone from your office um, culture wise and have them start. Now they don't stay that long. It may be one or two years to start to set up that culture. We were pretty lucky at this company where the first sales leader, not the first person I hired there, but the first sales leader also it happens to be European, have an EU passport and a U.S. That passport. Helps. So it was beautiful. And she's in Galway. But the first hire that we had boots on the ground was out of the U.K. And that's vice president of sales for EMEA. How do you so, decide I mean, yeah. uh, who that person should be to send from like HQ over to the new office to instill the culture? You know, usually it's someone that has... Uh, you know, a lot of leadership qualities. There's someone that um, exudes the company culture. They are, have the desire to have international travel. They're um, motivated. And so, and, and they've somehow or another in conversations as you're doing career discussions and things like that, it's come up in conversation. Mm. So I, I've been lucky in that way. Um, actually, I've, I think I've brought three people, three or four Actually, it's more than that. Because I think back on 30 years ago when I was at Digital Equipment, I brought someone from the U.S. over to Paris, and he ended up staying five years. And he, oh, wow. he managed all of EMEA. And it was because we wanted, again, the culture. There were a lot of people from digital there, but we wanted the culture of what it was that we were doing, which was the aerospace business. So, You know, that's interesting. Uh, I knew, so when we opened an office in, um, in the UK at the start of last year, um, which was an interesting time to yeah. decide to open an office. And um, we sent over, and to be clear to everybody watching, I wasn't involved in these decisions, but I got to kind of watch from the sidelines. We sent over somebody who um, has been referred to as the mayor of outreach. He just, he knows everybody. Uh -huh. It's as if the values at outreach were written to describe this person and um, sitting from the sidelines in retrospect, you know, I watched that happen and I was, wow, what a great choice. And yeah. I always kind of wondered when they were deciding who to send, if that was just an obvious choice or if there was some kind of process they applied, but it sounded like it probably happened organically. It had probably been discussed and was like part of his you know, disc, you know, career plan or conversations with, with leadership at some point. Yeah. And, and it could have happened or very organically and, and it could have happened very sort of on purpose. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you should say mayor because when I was at Smart Bear, the person that we brought over was called the mayor of Galway. That's what he was <laughs> called. He was just, you know, he, he just got right into the, the whole culture and fabric of Galway and, got involved in so many things. It was really quite, uh, quite rewarding to watch and see. So, so I'll just move on to um, looking at things like uh, a couple of the other elements, which is budgeting and looking at, okay, can we afford this? Is this something that we're, we're going to get scared if things aren't 
working well and we're going to jump and pull back? Or do you have the intestinal fortitude to move forward and put that investment in for pick a period of time, at least 12 months? You know, it's for me, it's something that you really have to think about um, not not being not being um, too over anxious on the results. And speaking of results from a KPI standpoint, I didn't know when I sent our very first person out internationally, what the goal sheet should look like day one. We let it evolve over the course of each quarter because when I hired him, it was two months before COVID hit. And so then we had COVID, you know, down, you know, we're in the midst of that pandemic. So what were the expectations first quarter, second quarter, third quarter? Finally, at the end of third quarter, we were able to actually hire salespeople not to come into an office in Galway. And then we were able to see the lead generation and things like that. And we started to see the progress of the business. But that's where I say, you know, it takes time and you really need to get to know the sort of the whole infrastructure of, in this case, EMEA and our market that we were going after. And then from a timeline standpoint, um, I think, again, you know, you need to be flexible. You need to understand, you know, what, when you want to move and what you're going to do with it. And I say flexible now more so because of the pandemic that did change a lot of the paradigm. But in the other, other times that I've moved over to Europe and Asia, you have commitment dates, you have the existing business that's going on, and then the new business that you're trying to proffer through having this investment. Do you, one of the great questions we got in the chat from Muhammad, thanks Muhammad, was um, how do you know when to pull the plug on, let's say, a whole new office or maybe just the sales strategy in a new office? And like, do you see your clients setting a time horizon of if this isn't working out by two years, we shutter it? Or is it kind of like chasing a career in show business where if you have a plan B, it just means you're going to fail? Yeah, I mean... You know, that's that's a, a tougher question, but I think what you do is you minimize your risk by not going all in until you start to see that momentum. Mm. So, you do, like, we've hired X number of salespeople every single quarter and every few months based on what we're seeing from a lead generation standpoint. So when we first went in, we, we knew there was already a, a um, demand and a funnel that was going on. But we kept the number of people that we had there to a low number until we started to see that really escalate. So as we started to invest, we also started to see the results. So I'd say that on the flip side, if you have gone in, you've got one or two people, it's just not happening. You're not able to establish the partnerships. It doesn't seem as though your product or service is resonating in that country or region. It's probably two years. I mean, it would be hard for me to say exactly what that would be, but I would say it would probably be somewhere in that vicinity. Sure. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I mean, it'll vary depending on sales cycles too, but you can certainly imagine if you're two and a half years into a territory and not seeing traction, that you've got a problem. <laughs> right, right. And that's why, you know, even this slide kind of answers some of that, right? It starts small. Um, yeah. And building a data-driven strategy. So you've seen that lead gen. And you can constantly look at the things like pricing and forecasting. We didn't know what the pricing tolerance would be in EMEA. We didn't know what it would be in APAC. And, you know, EMEA, the nice thing about the EU is it's 27 countries. It's one currency. It's Mm -hmm. easier to do business because there's some similarities and there's, you know, a whole different kind of look there. You go to Asia It's 48 separate countries with 48 separate currencies, 48 separate um, identities and everything else. So so you really need to be prescriptive of what you're doing. So, for instance, for us, with Asia, we went in very, very lightly. We hired our GM out of Singapore one month. Then we hired our head of marketing the next month. And then we just populated with a few people. Sales in September, partner managers sprinkled throughout, and now we're, we've started to go into other countries. So we're in we're in Australia, we're in Korea, we're in Taiwan, we're in Hong Kong, um, 
probably New Zealand. We have a huge constituency of people in India and we're in Malaysia. So we're, we, we slowly went into all those different countries. They can't be served in Asia the same way that you can serve in EMEA. So for instance, why I also chose Galway is because you can get multilingual, bilingual people out of Galway for the leads that are coming in for all the respective countries. So the people that we hired in Galway, besides the English speaking people, that that's their primary number one language, were Spanish speaking, German, French, Nordic, um, Hebrew. We, we hired people that speak all these languages so that when the leads come in, the first thing that they're hearing from their salesperson is their language, their language. which is also great. You know, and we're moving toward um, now having 13 languages for our website and many, much of our collateral. We're going through a huge localization project because, and of course, we don't do that lightly either, because we found now that we've been there for a year, year and a half, that the demand is there, the leads will come in and people speaking their own language is always best. So if mm -hmm. you can do it, it definitely makes sense. And that's what I found with Galway. It was just a source of just richness when it came to this piece of it. Kind of interesting. interesting. It is yeah. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I love it. It's a it's a great it's a great city. Well, it's actually probably not quite a city, but it's a great place. And dealing with the government in Ireland is just fantastic too. So but many many countries are like that too. And we don't have everyone in Ireland. We have people in all the countries because right. from a partner standpoint, it's important to have them speaking the same language and being in country because partner people visit face-to-face. -face. Our sales environment is more inside sales, so it's not face-to-face. Um, -face. It's not outside sales as the saying goes. Right, right, right. Yeah. So again, um, collecting the right data, aligning your team. So this is where I mentioned before is having some, some big objectives that we want to accomplish, but also daily goals or weekly goals. Daily might be a bit much. Um, it's certainly daily when it comes to salespeople, you know, touching so many, so many leads, making so many calls, all those types of things. Um, and making sure that the team is together on, align on alignment. And then sales process, I can't speak enough about how important process is. It's funny, when I was selling, I thought process was just the worst word ever. It's like, what? I have to follow a process? No, no, no. Process is the lifeblood of sales. And, um, you know, maybe years ago when I was an individual contributor, I would think that. But And, and when CRMs became big, a lot of salespeople, probably myself included, thought oh why am i doing this it's got to be for the manager no it's for yourself it's for yourself and it is part of the ecosystem of sales but being able to have a sales process is so important being able to follow the kpis like we get a lead in it must have six touches before it goes back to marketing for nurture so there's all kinds of things that we do day to day that make a big difference from from those kind of things so having that sales process I'm, I'm sure everyone here knows that because <laughs> that's that's a really important piece as well. There's repeating. The process is what makes it all predictable. As I tell my team all the time, I would rather lose and know exactly why we lost than win and have no idea why. Yeah, um, yeah. Because exactly. then you can turn that knowledge into more wins. Actually, this aligns well with a uh, question Dr. Hoyle asked. Amazing questions, by the way, Dr. Hoyle. Um, <laughs> saying, some of his research is indicating that sales forecasting, particularly in maybe the more developed B2B um, cultures, is starting yeah. to use big data and AI to forecast. And I guess he's wondering, what are challenges of forecasting internationally? Um, I would say, you know, for us, because we were we were in business for so many years in the U.S., it was extremely predictable how long that sales cycle would be. It was 42 days average. And, you know, some were three days and some were two years and everything in between. Um, you could 
pretty much predict how things were going to go in the U.S. As soon as we went into new markets, throw all that out the window. Yes, you have maybe a baseline, but everything changed. And the way that people buy is, it's different. It's not hugely different, but it's different. The rigor that they might go through is different. Um, the fact that we're a new player in this region, whatever region, EMEA, APAC, LATAM, and maybe different than some of the local providers of the same solution are, you know, some of those types of things do elongate the sales process. So AI is great. We, lo we love to feed our data. We love to, we, we create um, demand curves so that we know X number of MQLs come in, turn into so many SQLs, turn into so many SALs, turn into so many, we call them master service agreements or net new customers. And that's something that we're working on honing in as well for EMEA and APAC, just a little different. So does that mean right now, basically every territory would need its separate forecast, maybe even a different separate, uh, a different forecasting methodology? No, it's the same. It's just it's that same. you it's look at it and you say, maybe their sales, maybe, maybe sales will take a little longer in the beginning. What we're finding now a year later is things are closing at the same rate they were at the U in the U.S. So it's Got just it. a matter of getting that rhythm down and, and getting that cadence with the team. So yeah, that makes sense. That how makes it works. Sense. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, data, we've talked about data, data back decision making is all kinds of ways to make that happen. But that's really important from the expansion. Just like you started this, Colin, I mean, you need a plan. You, you put that plan together. And plans are meant to be living documents. So it's not something that would be, you know, uh, the Bible and that's it. And it's going to stay the same. That's not the way it works. It should always be refined, honed, and looked at in, in um, totality all the time. So when it comes to, so the, the infrastructure, as we talked about, is it a physical presence? Usually, yeah. You know, it, there's going to be some type of office or you're in home offices now. Um, subsidiaries um, qualify as compliant? Yes, I mean, they do. Titles, applications, all of these things. But we, we also talked about how easy it is to put together a um, presence without actually having to do this. So we'll get to that in a moment, setting up the subsidiary per se. But it will be important to understand, do you have all the back office there? And I mentioned that earlier, that that's something that comes usually, and we find this with our customers, they come to us and they say, we want to put one person in a country. The next thing you know, they're putting three or four. And then the next thing you know, they're going to more and more countries. And over time, they may set up all the human resources, payroll, IT, or, or in the cases of our customers, we're doing a lot, we're doing at least the payroll for them. We're doing all the compliance and taxes and things like that for them. Just to give you an example. So um, some companies, and and we I I can't say their name, but some companies that work with us, they have localized their products. And these are hard good products for different um, countries that they're in, which is very interesting. Or, you know, like I said, sometimes it's just a matter of localization from a software perspective or from a website perspective. It doesn't always mean that you have to do everything in language. It depends on the country. So looking at all of these types of pieces um, with regard to that testing and quality is really important too when companies decide to go overseas. So that's something that you can look at in detail based on the type of product that you have. Software is easy. It's pretty much English language across the world, um, but other things may or may not be. So that's, you know, when you're looking at expanding, that's certainly something that you have to consider. To consider. And then when we look at um, regulatory and legal compliance, this is huge. Um, this is different in every single country, just like in the U.S., there's different laws and regulations in every single state. There's that same type of thing, not quite, I mean, 
the United States is more united than the rest of the world, but every single country has their own set of rules. And so you have to look up whether or not you're going to expand as you expand smoothly into another country without violating any of those laws or rules is a top priority for all people that go into this new country. So a lot of times you have the government that helps you, like when we established in Galway, we had the government helping us with what we were going to do to establish there. So companies need to ask themselves, are you going to set up a subsidiary or a regional presence? Um, if you do that, you must have a local bank account. You have to register with tax authorities. You have to get commercial certifications. You must maintain records and filings. Possibly you're initiating patents and trademark reviews. And then you must administer compliant payroll, compensation, employee benefits. Um, the thing that we sell is the fact that you don't have to do any of that if you work with an EOR. Because we do help companies go into these new countries without having to do all that. We do that for you. So what happens is an employee come from you, you pick the talent. They come on board our compliant payroll. We take care of all the aspects of their employment from not onboarding from the standpoint of learning about the company, but onboarding just from a payroll, benefits, all of those types of things, expense reports, all the way to termination, or as we like to say, early retirement. And that way, like I said before, it's a very low cost way of getting into a new country for the first time. And that's why companies come to us as an EOR to make that happen. We always like to show you and balance the fact that these are the types of things that you have to do, though, if you want to set up a subsidiary. So companies that work with us and other EORs, typically, they'll bring in a few people in the beginning um, through an EOR, employer of record. And then if they get to a critical mass, it could be 20 people, 30 people, whatever it is, then, then they say, okay, I'm going to go through setting up a subsidiary. These days, it's more difficult because what happens is with COVID, travel has been restricted. A lot of these governments have shut down during the pandemic. Some of these countries require a wet signature in order to be compliant and have your subsidiary. So there's things that take a lot of time. So my last company, we didn't, we used, um, we set up subsidiaries in Malaysia, Malta, China, Mozambique, and maybe one other place just while I was there. And it took forever. It takes forever, you know, so, but we didn't know about EOR and, and it's kind of like one of the best kept secrets. <laughs> so so it's not, this was actually a question from... Aaron, I believe earlier, where he was asking, you know, how do I decide whether to just establish my own entity or use an EOR? And it sounds like there's some relatively simple math you do that there's like eventually a break even point. You know, you estimate the costs and time investment of setting up an entity. And maybe it makes sense when your office is really big, but if you're just opening a small, smaller office, you it makes more sense to use an EOR. It definitely does. Um, but the flip side of, of what you said, which is what you said first, is some companies and many that have come with us say, you know what, I don't want the hassle of doing it. And so that break even point now has moved up and up and up where mm -hmm. the fees are still minimal in comparison to the headache of doing all the work that it takes to bring HR on you have to bring HR in, you have to bring finance in, you have to have some kind of legal support, whether you're paying for outside or inside. And it's just at the taxes that must get paid, the knowledge of that country that must be adhered to. And that's why it took so long for Nicole to build this company, because she set up the entities in all these countries over the course of the last 10 years, so yeah. that we could hire people on behalf of our customers for them compliantly. And that's at the end of the day, the name of the game. The other thing to consider, and, and a lot of people don't know this, and I'm sure all of the people that are listening today do, is employment at will 
is only a U.S. phenomenon. And so to let someone go is a very lengthy process. It's um, very strict in certain countries. I mean, I'm going to, they're going to remain nameless, but there's some that are really tough. It's very expensive. And so with an EOR, we actually handle all of that. So I've terminated people in different countries and had to have U.S. HR people fly to these countries to make that happen. And so we, because we have people already on the ground everywhere, we take care of that. And of course, those are the extreme cases, but they are the extreme cases that make it, like I said before, a true headache. So I just want to point that out as well. This isn't maybe actually another question from Aaron and, and uh, a little bit more of a particular situation, but I think it's interesting and maybe an example of the headaches. Um, Aaron was mentioning that in India and um, parts of Latin America, there is a tax on foreign software. And he has run into situations where uh, his clients, after agreeing upon a price, are insisting that his company pay the tax. But it sounds like that's not consistent. It's only some companies. Can you enlighten us as to any strategies with dealing with that? or? You know, yeah, that's not my area of expertise, Colin and Aaron. Sorry, um, I don't. I don't know about that. I mean, that's an a tax advisor would really have to be the one to talk to you about that. All right, good luck, Aaron. Sorry, it's <laughs> all right. Sorry better better than having some kind of off the cuff made up stuff. Right, right. So another um, really great resource is on our website. I highly recommend that you download this um, handbook, which really helps you to look at what it takes to build one your strategy a little bit, but also what it takes to, to grow and go internationally. Um, it's a it's a great there there's a wealth of knowledge on our website that can help you a lot with all the nuances of what goes on in every single country. That's called Globalpedia great resource. It tells you all about the laws, the regulations, how much vacation pay, what the benefits are, what the parental leaves would be, things like that. We have experts that have written all kinds of blogs as well as all kinds of papers on different things that are going on. We of course have Brexit in the UK. So we have a whole hub on Brexit and what that would mean to you and what that would mean to hiring in the UK. And then we have, as mentioned, this go-to-market workbook, which is really something that can help you answer all these questions. You can fill it out as a checklist and things like that. So it's something that we really encourage you to download and have at your disposal. So there you go. Right on. I'm going to drop the link in, uh, in the chat here for everybody, too. So you can get it really easily. It's right there. Nice. Uh, Angela Scott, thanks for this in the comments throughout the, another good resource is kiss, bow, uh, or shake hands. Uh, yeah, I, I figured it out. Thanks, Angela. My, um, back when I, before I stopped my MBA, one of my, um, professors at business school used to tell me this story about a, uh, business person, salesperson, and who is American, um, trying to open a new office in France. Um, mm. and went there and this person that he, it might've been Germany. I don't remember, but the person from the country he was entering was talking very close to him and he stepped away yes. and, um, because he felt like it was rude and he was invading his space. Meanwhile, this poor European person is like, how rude this guy doesn't want to talk to me. He starts walking away every time I try to talk to him. <laughs> um, so those little cultural things matter. And that well, is a good resource. Speaking, yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, Colin, the, the natural distance that we like is 18 inches. Something like that. And how many people go inside that space? It's you're right. It's just like, yeah, like three people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a difficult one. Also, yeah. you know, when you do two kisses or three kisses and, you know, hugs, or not hugs, you know, there's just, but those kinds of things you can read about. Um, and find out what's acceptable country by country. There's lots of cultural books or the internet just has everything on what to do. You do find what's... that um, as, you know, 
more businesses are doing business internationally, that violation of local custom has become a little bit less taboo? Like, are we all a little bit more understanding or am I just being too hopeful? (laughs) Well, I, I think it's, you know, why would our culture and what we do supersede something that's in another country? You know, they've, they've established, we're one of the youngest countries, so mm-hmm. they've established their rules, regulations, customs, um, local ways of everything, doing business or being with families, whatever it happens to be. And I think just as you're traveling, and I, I've done this every time I've traveled to a new country where I was unfamiliar, is just familiarize yourself with what's acceptable. It, it, it doesn't veer too far off. There's only a few things to sort of make yourselves aware of, but it is important, I think, and it's, and it's respectful. And we want, when we travel for that country and those people to say, hey, Americans are cool, you know, not, oh, those darn Americans, right? So it, it's an important thing to, I think, be respectful of. We're a melting pot, we're everything, so anything goes. <laughs> I don't know that that's the case everywhere else. In fact, right. I know it, yeah. Um, a couple, <laughs> Angela is agreeing with you almost word for word in the comments. <laughs> um, there were a couple other questions specifically about uh, GP. Uh, Angela mm-hmm. is asking if y'all also help source executive talent or like new leadership. That's a very good question. Um, we don't, but we have a huge partner network that we can put you in touch with depending what country you're looking at or countries you're looking at. We have probably 30 recruiting firms that are our partners around the world. So we can pretty much handle most of the different countries that you would be interested in going into, I'm sure. So that's something, please feel free to reach out to me and we can get you in touch with. The person that works for me that heads up all of the recruiting partners, he's based out of the UK and he's excellent. So we'd be happy to have you work with him and sort of figure out where where the best place to go is. And if Are you, you looking mind, at EMEA or Asia? or? Go ahead, Angela, and answer. I'll drop, if you don't mind, Dan, I'll drop your LinkedIn in the chat sure. so she can get in touch. Sure. There we go. Um, great. Bye, Anna. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, <laughs> another question from Daniel Stewart earlier was, uh, you mentioned COVID briefly. And he's wondering if there are any um, strategies you've seen businesses use to expand internationally with all the different, you know, travel restrictions vary and Mm -hmm. come and go as you and I were talking about earlier today. Yes. So how are are you seeing your clients deal with that? So first of all, um, all of us have hired everyone since March of last year without ever meeting anyone below here. Right. I mean, that's about all we know. Like you have no idea what's, (laughs) <laughs> below the line and so I think we've all been um in a situation where we're 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 all equals you know we're all on zoom and things like that so firstly we've hired in our company alone um let's see 350 people since I started and of, of those I would say 275 we've never met face to face and we're still on this you know, huge upward ramp of hiring. And I think what we've all done, and this includes our customers, we've, we've hired them via Zoom mm-hmm. and we've interviewed via Zoom and things like that and references. And people have stayed within their countries. As, as hard as that is and as difficult that is, they, we've, we've hired in all the different countries that I mentioned just from my experience. Similarly, our customers have done the same but they haven't gone outside the walls of their countries yet. Now we, we see some movement that EU's opening up. So we'll start to see intra Europe travel going on. Asia opened and now are closed again. Australia is locked up. So is New Zealand. Eight, uh, you can't, I was saying this to Colin earlier, you can't drive from Malaysia to Singapore anymore. And a lot of Malaysians work in Singaporean companies. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's been very, very difficult. But again, if you can limit yourself or look at what your territory might be and hire 
Like for instance, we, we hired in Singapore to handle Asia, but then we hired in the respective different countries to hire that, to work in that country. And you can pretty much in some of them move freely. Like all of a sudden now the UK is opening up a little bit. So people are starting to have the face-to-face -face meetings again. Does that answer the question? I, just I think so. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to you rattle off the restrictions you seem to know off the top of your head, though. I'm curious how you keep up with all of it. Is there like a central place where you look up travel restrictions? <laughs> I just read a lot. Um, <laughs> I talk to all the people that work for me that tell me. Um, I, do, I do look and see. I mean, I get a lot of information from Asia and, and Europe. Mm -hmm. And of course, Latin America is close. So we know what's going on with Mexico and Brazil. I just hired six or eight people in Colombia for the first time for our company. They have a rich um, business development, sales, and software development community. It's a great, in Medellin in particular, we have about 110 people or so in Mexico City. Mexico City is awesome. There's so many English speakers. They're really great in sales, business development, finance. Um, and HR. So there's lots of places that you can hire great talent all around the world. You just kind of need to know a little bit about what's going on from a COVID standpoint. I think as time goes on, we'll start to see offices open again. We're opening in the US, right? A little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. And like mentioned, across Europe, but not everywhere. But that doesn't mean you can't build up business there because business is still going on. Our customers, have hot, I can't believe how many new countries they go into every quarter. So we we have net new customers. They usually, like I said earlier, go into one or two countries, and the next thing you know, they're in five or six. So it hasn't stopped business. It hasn't stopped growth. But the other thing is talent. You can hire talent. If you find someone great that's in a time zone that's reasonable for you, you can hire them, and you can hire them easily. And before you'd say, oh, I need to hire someone in the U.S. I need to hire someone in the same country. And it's not like that anymore. It's really changed. Right. This is fascinating. And I could talk about this all day with you. Um, <laughs> we're just Thank about you. at time. Do you have any parting words for our community, Diane? Well, reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help and share our experiences and anything we can do to help you to onboard folks easily, quickly. Um, and you know, we're one of the women that works for me wrote this global sales strategy. She worked for me in another company too. She's just amazing. Um, you know, we have a lot of knowledge about this subject and we're happy to get involved and please go to the website because it's just so much that can help you too. But now that you have my LinkedIn, you can come directly to me as well and I can steer you to the right people if I can't answer the question. So I, I really love this subject. It's um, a huge passion of mine. Hopefully you can tell. <laughs> and uh, it's what I've enjoyed doing my whole life, traveling with family and then traveling for work and helping companies, you know, expand globally is like a dream come true because I love it. So thank you, Excellent. Colin. Well, thank you so much for bringing uh, your passion and your expertise to the sales hacker community today. We really appreciate it. Uh, some great we're already getting rave reviews in the chat um so Aww. thanks to you and thanks of course to uh the sales hacker community y'all just always i mean i do these like at least once a week and it just blows me away every time highlight of my week you ask great questions <laughs> you come prepared to engage we really appreciate your time with us today and i hope you have a great rest of your day everybody thanks yeah, thank thanks you so much bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.